Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome, welcome to our Monday, Thursday service on this Holy Week. We're so glad that you are a part of this worship experience at the C.N. Jenkins Memorial Presbyterian Church. We know we can't do anything without God, but with God, all things are possible. So God, we pray now that you will come by here one more time. God, we pray that you will make yourself known in the hearts of all of those worshiping. God, we pray that the word that is lifted up tonight will be a word that somebody will be able to hold on to the strength in their life. And God, we know that you are in charge of this service, so have your way, we pray, in your son's name. We all shout together, hallelujah and amen. creator. Y'all, this is Holy Week. This is Monday, Thursday. We do know that on this night, it is our tradition that we will have a celebration of a Seder meal. So if you are watching uh, right now at home and you've already prepared that, we ask blessings to be upon it. Uh, we will observe communion on Sunday, Easter Sunday, Resurrection. So there's no need for us to set aside that time of that sacrament. But particular tonight's service is about service. It is about remembering Christ as he uh, donned the apron and, and rolled up his sleeves and washed his disciples' feet. It is a service, y'all, for us to be mindful of God's ultimate love for us all. And so we invite you now to join me as we pray and as we continue to seek God's anointing and the words again, but also the spirit as we honor our risen Lord. Let us pray. Lord, as we prepare to enter this mystery of the next three of the most holy days, we ask that you will illumine our minds and our hearts with the hope and the promise of Christ's passion. God, we recognize it is only through death, through a good Friday, that we have Easter morning resurrection. God, you sent your son into the world, and before his hour had come, he washed his disciples' feet. God, you had given him all things into his hands, but from his hands he exemplified what it means to serve. God, he knelt down on the floor and washed the friend's feet. God, he reached down and, and did something as an example of how we too should serve one another. Lord God, help us to learn from his example. Help us to do as he has done. The world will know that we are his disciples as we show your love. God, we pray that you will strengthen our hands and our wills for the love that comes from your word. God, bless now, we pray, as those who watch, those who gathered, God, those who will listen, God, that their, their, their feel will come by the presence of your holiness. Thank you, God, for the preached word, and we pray that you will preach through your preacher tonight and that she will be able to call down the angels of heaven into our hearts. God, thank you for what we are about to receive in the preaching moment. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Cross 
so Jesus me it's more than songs we sing much more than an emblem of the chain but it means I am free from the chains of slavery and the blood that shed Just for me, just for me. Just for me and just for you and just for our life to be in the presence of Almighty God. We are grateful uh, for the resurrection power that comes through our faith walk in Jesus Christ. My friends, tonight as we are worshiping by way of YouTube, by way of Facebook, and those all the mediums uh, that you dialed in, we are indeed grateful. You are making indeed a difference in the lives of so many around the world as C.N. Jenkins continues to be a light on a hill shining brightly for the Lord. You know, we celebrate uh, many things that have happened this first quarter of the year. Believe it or not, yes, we've gone through January, February, and March, and God has blessed us tremendously. Major, major shout out to our ministry of outreach. We are still serving food every Tuesday. We are still able to reach out to those in our community with your contributions and donations. Also, also, we had a wonderful, wonderful culmination of a pilot project that we were able to do serving more than 125, 150 meals every second and fourth Saturday. So thank you for your support. Thank you to all the volunteers, the hospitality ministry, and so many who delivered those meals to those people in our community. For our youth and young adults, you keep on having those major drives. And I think even the Presbyterian women have done an outstanding job. We delivered uh, a, a truckload, matter of fact, three carloads of suitcases last week to children, children in foster care, and we thank you for the partnership that happens with outreach. Y'all, God is doing a wonderful thing in this ministry, and you are supporting it in a loving way. So as we prepare to receive our offering tonight, we want you to give freely and liberally, knowing that you are making a difference in the lives of those around us. Join us as we pray. Eternal God, thanking you for all the gifts, those big and those small. But God, we thank you most importantly for a generous heart. And we pray that as we give this evening, God, that you will bless it. And God, you will use the monies that are then set aside for mission and outreach. God, those who are hungry, may they be fed. God, those who are clothless, God, may they be clothed. God, those who find themselves needing just a little bit to get them over the hump. May our ministry of compassion and benevolence be there for them. Thank you for the hand that gives and the hand that receives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, Ooh, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a Sanctuary for you. Come on, wherever you are, help me sing. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Oh, pure and holy. Try. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy and merciful Lord, we thank you for preparing us to be a sanctuary, preparing our hearts and our minds, O oh God, in worship to you and in service to you. We thank you for how your spirit has already moved in this service. We thank you for this Monday, Thursday, for this holy week, for an opportunity, O oh God, to just draw closer to you during this Lenten season and even today to be in worship in this virtual space. God, we say thank you. Now, O oh Lord, it is your preaching time. It is the time, O oh God, where we attend our hearts and our minds to you. 
So, Lord, speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit in the places where we are, oh God. We pray that you would give us a rhema word. I pray, oh God, that you would speak through me as your servant, as the one called to speak your word on this day so that we might be changed and transformed and drawn closer onto the path that you have for our lives. God, we thank you for the word that's coming forth, and we thank you for your spirit that is always with us. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Beloved, I invite you to go with me to the scripture today. Our scripture comes from the Gospel of John. It is chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. It is the New International Version. Hear ye the word of the Lord. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things uh, under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Uh, Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? Jesus asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Again, in this text, I want to highlight or pin a topic or a verse for us to concentrate on. These two verses, verses 14 and 15. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Well, brothers and sisters, I would just li like and invite you to just walk with me for a little while as I preach and teach with this sermon title and subject in mind, uh, Exemplary Service. Uh, exemplary Service. Uh, if we were in the sanctuary, I would just say, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, we got to serve uh, with the example uh, that Jesus has given us. My brothers and sister, isn't it true that the majority of our habits and our values are built upon the models we see 
or the circumstances that we navigate through in life. When we are born into this world, we do not know how to tie our shoes, y'all, uh, or to put our clothing on, uh, or to cook or clean or read or write or to love one another or be in relationship with each other. We don't know what love looks like or what love feels like or how it is manifested in our lives, but as we navigate through life, uh, we pick up on healthy uh, or unhealthy patterns of behavior behaviors uh, based upon what is modeled before us. Uh, what I mean is as we navigate through our lives, we automatically acquire certain skills uh, or values from maybe from our parents uh, or our aunties or our uncles or our loved ones or even acquaintances or friends uh, or people that we encounter maybe in college or, or maybe in other spaces that we acquire uh, these models or these patterns of behavior. Behaviors. And as parents, we teach our children uh, through modeling in the home how to be in relationship with each other, how to work through conflict, uh, how to support one another, how to articulate our needs, how to tie our shoes, y'all. Uh, we teach our kids from a young age how to care for their bodies, uh, how to build good manners, how to create healthy boundaries, uh, how to ma navigate or manage uh, our personal schedules, uh, build healthy eating uh, and exercise patterns, learn self-control, uh, kindness, love, patience, and sacrifice. Uh, when our children are at school or at our auntie's house or uncle's house or even sometimes the grandparents' house, uh, they learn certain values uh, and skills uh, from those that they are around. Uh, and I know as we look back over our lives that we can remember the various models uh, that God has placed in our lives. Uh, whether it be our parents or our big mamas, our aunties or our uncles, uh, our cousins, our spiritual leaders, uh, or friends who taught us something uh, that will forever positively shape uh, who uh, we are today. Uh, and y'all, in our text for today, Jesus offers the disciples a model uh, of behavior in how they are to serve those among them. Uh, we realize as parents that our children do what we do uh, more than what we say. Uh, so God and Jesus is modeling before them a pattern of behavior that is exemplary service uh, so that they can do what he does uh, and not just uh, what he says. Um, but what they are understanding and what they are navigating through is Jesus showing them how to serve uh, as they should. Uh, so Jesus Jesus in this text offers the disciples a pattern of behavior to emulate as he washes their feet. The act of washing feet is revolutionary, y'all, because it is countercultural to the society they have lived in for oh so long. We know that it's only been three short years that Jesus begins to transform their minds, and Jesus is walking with them, and Jesus has called them out to be a part of his inner circle uh, of followers. Uh, and as they walk with Jesus and as Jesus is talking with them, uh, they, he begins to cultivate them uh, into a new mindset, uh, understanding uh, that they are now following the pattern of the new covenant uh, in Christ Jesus. Uh, he's cultivating kingdom principles and everything that he says and does while he's around the disciples. So this act of foot washing, uh, y'all, is countercultural because at the time of Jesus's ministry, the Roman Empire was in control of the land of Galilee, where the majority of Jesus's ministry took place uh, with the Judean people. We realize that Jesus's ministry took place around the Sea of Galilee. 
Jesus is now going and, to, and doing the ministry work. And uh, Jesus is in the midst of Galilee, uh, where the majority of the work is taking place. And G Julius Caesar is now uh, uh, Caesar of the land. And he installed Herod as king of Judea. He enforced a military style leadership in cities, worship Caesar as God. There was a heavy taxation of those in Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. High poverty, y'all, and many Jewish families were impoverished, increasing in debt. Ninety-seven percent of the people lived in some sort of degree of poverty, and only three percent were the elite who capitalized on the poor. It sounds a little something like what we go through today. The poor was subjugated to paying high taxes that went toward great building plans and campaigns. So in the midst of this sort of society uh, where the influence was in the hands of the elite uh, or the most powerful, Jesus introduces uh, washing feet. Uh, and I don't think you got what I'm hurt, what got the fullness of what I said right there in that statement. In a period when the majority of the poor were the people Jesus was with, uh, Jesus demonstrated that, that the way to power and authority uh, is to be a servant. Uh, the thing that Jesus did was countercultural uh, to the society. So other words, uh, in the midst of a society that values power, money, and influence, uh, Jesus introduces being humble, uh, and then you will be exalted. Uh, in the midst of a society that puts their knees on the necks of the poor and the most vulnerable among them, uh, Jesus says, I come to serve by preaching good news to the poor and setting the captives free. In the midst of a society that lords it over people, Jesus is saying, you, my disciples, my followers, you don't do that. You take the posture of a servant and serve the least of these. And then when you do that, you will be great. In the midst of a society where the religious leaders, y'all, uh, they had got caught up in the money game. Uh, Jesus says, be generous uh, and help the poor and vulnerable among you. Uh, what I want you to see here is that it is in the midst of this oppressive culture that Jesus models exemplary service. And I just wonder, as you look into the world today, have you seen models uh, of exemplary service as we are navigating through a hard time in our society? Where do you see exemplary service? Where do you think that God is calling you uh, to move out and be uh, the church of Jesus Christ in 2021? Y'all, exemplary service is defined as serving as a desirable model representing the best of its kind. And in this text, Jesus offers the best way to lead through serving. As we look over our world today, we can see that there are many similarities with the Roman Empire and the situations we deal with today. We often contend with laws that cause the rich to get richer and the poor to get poor. We see the wealth gap is growing as the elite or the wealthiest groups of people are getting smaller, which means the others are, are decreasing in wealth. There are leaders of our country that desire to be worshipped and followed in a deified way. People are challenged and competing with one another in the marketplace and also in the church. The word on the street signals for us to embrace a mindset of scarcity, tempted to love money more than we should, and to love power and acquire it as at all means necessary, even if it means stepping on others to get there. But I love Lord tells us that we live in a state of abundance. Can y'all just say abundance? Uh, where there is more than enough for everyone uh, to thrive and build what God has in mind. Uh, Jesus is inviting the disciples and us uh, to embrace a different model of living uh, from what we see uh, and what we are used to. Uh, this was not 
the first time Jesus modeled this sort of behavior, y'all. For it was throughout his ministry, throughout the three years that the disciples was walking with Jesus and Jesus was walking with them and talking with them and showing them how they were to serve. It wasn't the first time for Jesus fed the 5,000 plus people. And we remember that he healed a lame man by the pool of Bethesda and gave the woman accused of adultery, made uh, and forgave the woman accused of adultery and healed the man uh, who was born blind and raised Lazarus from the dead uh, and comforted Mary and Martha over and over again. Jesus uh, models leadership uh, that is example of servanthood for his followers. Uh, Jesus postures himself again in this text in a servant role, uh, but it's a little different from times before. This time Jesus is serving the disciples directly by washing their feet. Uh, the service is being done to them the scripture says Jesus gets up from the meal, uh, takes off his outer clothing, wraps a towel around his waist, pours water into a basin, and began to wash uh, his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Uh, so, brothers and sisters, this is our question on uh, this Monday, Thursday. Uh, what lesson does Jesus want us to learn uh, through this sacrificial act? Well, Seb, siblings, I submit to you, and I just came by to share with you three things uh, and three points in this sermon uh, that I believe that Jesus is teaching us. There is so much more, but I just want you to hang on to these three. Uh, one thing that Jesus is telling us in order for us to show and offer exemplary service, we must first let go of of some things. Uh, type it in the chat. You got to let go. You got to let go. You got to let go of some things. Uh, for the text says Jesus got up from the meal uh, and the first thing he did was take off uh, his outer clothing. Um, now the act of taking off his outer clothing symbolized the removal uh, of what was familiar to him uh, and to the disciples. Y'all, he took off part of a symbol of his position and presence with them. Uh, he took off something in order to put on something new. Oh, y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, he took off uh, this outer garment so that he might enter into a different posture or position that was ordained by God. Uh, oh, hear me, beloved, in order for you to go uh, where God wants you to go uh, and go and get what God has in store for you. Uh, some things you're going to have to leave behind. Uh, some things you're just going to have to let go of uh, in order for you to embrace what God has for you. Uh, you got to let go of some things. Uh, and maybe in order for you to gain the promotion, uh, you have to let go of working in the state of pro procrastination uh, and get your work done early uh, or let go of some negative perceptions of how you think about yourself and embrace uh, the goodness of who you are. Maybe you are wanting to launch into a new career but you are scared to step out and do it. You need to let go of fear and replace it with faith and trust that God will help you navigate through every twist and every turn, that God will get you there right on time. Maybe you need to take off some titles that are holding you back from serving all people with love and compassion. Maybe you need to let go of control so that you can move forward in your leadership with collaboration and a cooperation and being obedient to the spirit of the living God. Maybe you need to let go of not being able to trust people and trust that God is working in the midst of all things, even when it doesn't turn out the way you want it to. All I'm saying, beloved, is that when you are called to be a leader in your home, in the marketplace, in the church, or wherever God positions you, you might just have to let go of some things uh, in order to embrace all God has in store. We got to let go, y'all. We got to let go of some things. Then, beloved, we must put on uh, some new ways of living. That's my second point. We got to let go, and then we got to put on something new. The scripture says, after Jesus took off the outer garment, Jesus put a towel around his waist 
when Jesus put the towel on, it symbolized taking on a servant position. He did it with no hesitation because, y'all, he knew who he was. When you know who you are, you can take off the role. You can take off the title. The title don't mean anything because you are so secure in your identity, worth, and value. How do I know this? Well, look in verse 3. It says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. So he got up. When you know who you are and the call God has on your life, you can take off any position or title in your life, uh, even if it is a servant role, and still know uh, your worth and value. And you don't need to be in control of every situation because you know God has already determined the end before the beginning. So you assume a position of surrendering, surrendering God, everything to God and understanding that everything is under the providence and control of God. In other words, you already know that God is all powerful and God has ordered your days and God has numbered the steps of your steps in this earth and God has ordained the path for your life and God has qualified you and God has anointed you to do good works uh, that he has determined before the foundations of the earth that you would walk in them and there is no one person that can take the call your anointing away from you and that has been determined by God. When you know that you know that you know that God is in control of your life, uh, you can take off the outer garment. Uh, you can lay down your pride. Uh, you can lay down your past hurts uh, and open up your mind uh, and your heart to receive a word from the Lord uh, that positions you to serve. God has already called, qualified, and positioned you with power, and there is no position that makes you who you are. Your identity and value comes from God. There is no position that makes you who you are. Your identity and power and anointing and authority comes from Almighty God. So then you realize everywhere your free feet trod is holy ground. Because the Holy Spirit was, is within you. So every room that your feet walk into is holy ground because God has already gone before you and prepared the way. So therefore, you're walking on holy ground. Every encounter you have with someone is a, a God-ordained moment. Every day you live is commanded by God and is a gift for you to be a blessing to someone. You realize God is in control and you are not. So you count your blessings and you go where God wants you to go. Y'all, we got to take off some things and put on some new ways of living to serve and go where God wants us to go. We can put on new ways of living and being that is pleasing to God when we know who we are. Jesus put on a towel and assumed the role of servant to wash his disciples' feet. So I want to ask you a question. What role is God calling you to put on? Maybe God is calling you to lead with kindness on your job or even in the church. Put on self-control as you lead and control your words and your toxic actions and behaviors that are oppressive and they are not life-giving. Put on leading with humility in your home. Put on thinking more, not thinking more highly of yourself than you are because everybody makes mistakes. Or maybe God wants you to release control. Just say release. You don't have to be in control of every situation or circumstance. And sometimes uh, when you try to control it, you make a, make a mess out of uh, what could have been worked out if you surrendered to God. Or maybe God wants you to put on a servant heart and think of someone else before you think about yourself. Oh, hallelujah. What is God calling you to put on? And what is God calling you to embrace as you move into this new season of your life? As you ponder these questions, beloved, know that when you take off some things and put on other things, it will bring about personal transformation. Just type transformation, transformation. You will be transformed. 
You will acquire new behaviors and new patterns of speaking and living as you follow what Jesus modeled in this text. And when you live your life according to Jesus' example, some people may not understand why you do what you do. You may seem just a little peculiar. And y'all know what I'm talking about. Jesus displayed what seemed to be peculiar behavior to Peter. Peter was one of Jesus' closest disciples, but Peter questioned why Jesus wanted to wash his feet. Jesus knew his God-given assignment was to humble himself and take the nature of a servant. He humbled himself, y'all, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So in other words, if Jesus didn't humble himself for his disciples and all who believe, we would not be saved and reconciled to God and one another. That's why Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Unless I give you my life, give up my life for you and wash all your sins away by my blood shed on the cross, you have no part with me. It may have seemed peculiar to Peter, but it was necessary for our salvation and necessary for our eternal rest and freedom. Beloved, do not be surprised when people think you are peculiar as you embrace a new way of living, as you embrace and step into uh, that transforming power. In our society, you ought to bless those who curse you uh, and pray for those who despitefully misuse you. It's just a little bit peculiar. It is countercultural to pray for your enemies and not return hate for hate or seek out vengeance, but leave it in the hands of the Lord to repay. It's just a little bit peculiar. The behavior of children of God can seem peculiar to those who do not understand. If people do not understand the reason you act that way, it's all right, baby. Keep on keeping on and just being obedient to do uh, what God calls you to do. Uh, but one thing I've realized that as we walk around uh, as peculiar people, uh, the gift of our peculiarity may spark someone to ask the question uh, that theologian Leslie Newbegin calls uh, the question that leads to life. Uh, and that question might be, uh, what makes you act the way you do? Uh, why are you're so happy uh, when it seems like everything is falling down around us. Uh, how can you be happy uh, in the midst of the pandemic? Uh, how can you still have joy uh, as racial discrimination is happening around the globe? Uh, how can you stand up and preach uh, as a woman called by God when there are other people uh, who will look at you uh, and say that you should not be preaching? Uh, well, baby, you can just turn to them and open up your mouth uh, and tell them a little bit about Jesus. Uh, you can tell him about the one uh, or tell her about the one uh, that saved your soul uh, and made you whole uh, or healed your body uh, and gave you strength uh, to keep on keeping on. Uh, or maybe tell them about Jesus, uh, the one that called you to preach, uh, the one that anointed you to preach, uh, the one that called you to serve. Uh, or maybe you talk about Jesus, uh, the Son of God, uh, that is the Savior of the world, uh, the one that is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, I call him Jesus. Uh, you might call him friend, uh, but he's also uh, a way maker, a heavy load carrier, a mind regulator. Y'all, he is my help. Uh, he is my joy. Uh, he is my everything. Uh, so that's all right if you call me peculiar, because it just opens up the door for me to tell you who Jesus is. Hallelujah. God is using you to model exemplary behavior in spaces that need to know who Jesus is. God oftentimes calls you into those spaces that are kind of cultural to the ways of God because he wants to use you as a light, as a light in the midst of darkness. So Baby, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I know this word is for someone. Don't be timid to walk into that space. Even when you see that there are demonic things or bad things happening in that space, God will use you. God will cover you. And God has already anointed your feet to walk in to that space. 
God is using us as a model of exemplary behavior, y'all. And spaces and places in which the word needs to be shared so that people's hearts are changed, transformed, and drawn closer to the Lord. When the word of the Lord, when the name of Jesus is exalted, God will draw all near to him. Y'all, so we must first, uh, we must first take off some things. We must first put on new ways of living. And then finally, the third point is we got to wash some feet. Just type it in the chat, wash feet. For it is in the focus scripture in verse 15, Jesus says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Y'all, one commentary informs us that the hot, dusty country of Palestine most people wore sandals, and their feet became extremely dirty. A water basin sat at the entrance of most Jewish homes. Upon entering a person's home, the poor would wash their feet, and the rich would have a servant available to wash their feet. Jesus was assuming the place of a servant, or as a slave who had no rights whatsoever. He was demonstrating that the way to royalty was service. The way to greatness is ministry. The way to power is humility. The way to position is serving. The way to rule is generosity. We find in Mark chapter 10, where the disciples are arguing over who was to assume the leading position in Jesus' government when he took over the kingdom. The disciples were so caught up, y'all, in their thirst for power and authority that they overlooked the core of Jesus' teaching. And then Jesus responds this way. He says to the disciples, the sons of Zebedee, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The way of true power, honor, and authority is through service, ministry, humility, and meeting the needs of others. Jesus says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. In other words, we too must serve and not be served. We must wash each other's feet. In a world that is ridden with the pandemic of COVID-19 and people being selfish by not wearing a mask, we must humble ourselves and think of others before we think of ourselves. Y'all, we must wash each other's feet. In a world that is ridden with senseless acts of gun violence, we need to spread more love by washing each other's feet. In a world where black men and women are targeted more than other minority groups for police brutality, we need to work toward just policing laws and wash each other's feet. In a state that is more concerned about voter suppression laws than senseless killings of Asian American people, we must wake up and wash each other's feet. In a world that discriminates on black women and girls, oftentimes devaluing our voices, intelligence paying us the lowest wages, and subjugating us to servant roles instead of under leadership roles in the church and in the marketplace, we got to wake up and wash each other's feet. From the words of Sojourner Truth, they say women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. We need to humble ourselves and wash each other's feet. In a world that perpetuates the cradle-to-prison pipeline, 
positioning many of our black and brown children into a funnel to prison instead of dismantling it. We need to realize the powers that are defeating and are benefiting from our children's expense. We must mobilize and seek justice to demand to dismantle these toxic systems. We need to wash each other's feet in a world that perpetuates white supremacy culture and colonialism, we must wake up, heal each other by washing uh, each other's feet. Um, and y'all, I'm almost done, but I want us to remember uh, on this Monday, Thursday, uh, that Jesus has left us an example to follow. Uh, and sometimes uh, we got to take off uh, what's hindering uh, our ability to serve uh, and put on uh, a new mindset of service uh, so that we can assume a servant posture and wash uh, each other's feet. Uh, when you uh, liberate the poor, you're washing feet. Uh, when you fight for the voiceless, uh, to have voice at the table, uh, you're washing feet. Uh, when you're seeking justice uh, for the oppressed, uh, for children, for elderly, for black and brown people, uh, those who are differently abled, uh, you're washing feet. Uh, when you pray for those uh, who are stressed uh, and listen to those uh, who are grieving, uh, you're washing feet. Uh, when you touch the untouchable, uh, those who have been exploded, excluded from society and deemed a lost cause, uh, you are washing feet. Uh, when you care for the sick among you, uh, you are washing feet. Uh, when you call and visit those in prison, uh, you are washing feet. Uh, when you don't think more highly of yourself than you ought, uh, you go and minister to people in need, uh, you are washing feet. Uh, when you give generously to your neighbor, you are washing feet. Uh, because Jesus is calling us to wash some feet, to wash some hurting feet, some suffering feet, some feet of people who are struggling with addiction of many kinds, people who are needing a positive word of encouragement, bound by distress and anxiety. We are called to wash some feet. And when we wash feet, we will show exemplary service. We will show service uh, that points to the God we serve. Uh, service uh, that points to the one uh, who is the truth. Uh, the one who is the life. Uh, the one who saved my soul uh, and made me whole uh, and picked me up uh, and turned me around uh, and kept my mind uh, and healed my broken heart uh, and fixed the situation uh, and gave me money uh, when I needed to pay my bills uh, and made a way uh, where there seemed to be no way uh, and fixed the conflict uh, and kept me from danger seen and unseen uh, and made sure I had food to eat uh, and a place to lay my head. Uh, Y'all know Jesus, uh, the one who turns your morning into dancing. Uh, when you wash feet, uh, you declare that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is calling us to wash feet and sometimes in order to go where God wants us to go and do what God wants us to do. Y'all, we got to take off what's hindering our ability to serve even when Judas is at the table. The one who would betray Jesus was also the one whom Jesus washed his feet. A new way of thinking and service is what God calls us to, that we may wash feet of others so they will know that you serve a God who loves them with an unconditional love. This is the word of the Lord for us today, that God is calling us to take off some things, to lay down some titles. Number two, put on some new ways of living. And then number three, wash some feet. Serve others. Serve the least of these. And when you do that, you will be serving Christ.
my invitation to you today on this Monday, Thursday. If there is one who desires a relationship with this God that modeled for the disciples, if you desire to be in relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I want you to reach out to us and give us a personal message on Facebook or even type your name or say, that's me on YouTube. And we want to connect with you. You can reach out to our church office at 704-332-9137. And someone will reach back out to you. But most of all, as a church, as believers in Christ, we want to make sure that you are connected to a growing and thriving community. So we invite you into relationship with God through salvation, but also through membership. As our senior pastor always says, we want you to grow where you're going. And we pray that you would find growth here at C and Jenkins in a part of this community. There are many things that we are doing. We are a multi-generational church. So you can find something from the ba for the babies all the way up to um, older adults. So we invite you to be a part of our community. And we also invite you to um, worship with us on Easter Sunday and worship with us tomorrow whenever we have our seven last words that will um, premiere at seven o'clock on Good Friday. But brothers and sisters, God wants us to have exemplary service. Exemplary service service as we go out from here today and serve the Lord. As we close out this service, let me pray with you. Holy and merciful God, we thank you for this opportunity to be in worship. We thank you for how you have shown us how to serve and how to love and how to be in relationship with one another by how you modeled exemplary service and leadership. Lord, we pray that you would kindle in our minds and our hearts what we need to take off, put on, and how to wash feet. Thank you for this word, and I thank you for how you will continue to minister to us throughout this week and throughout this holy weekend that we are going into. Bless us abundantly, keep us safe, and also keep us attuned to your spirit at work in our lives. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, beloved. I'm glad that you joined with us today. Leave from this place. Have an amazing evening. And we will see you on YouTube tomorrow for the Seven Last Words worship service. Praise be to God. Have a good evening.